I'm excited for today's Coffee Break conversation with community leader and executive recruiting rock star and friend of Wedwood, Ashley Ford. She's the founder and CEO of Hire for Hope, a Grand Rapids-based recruitment and talent optimization agency. Thank you for being here today, Ashley. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Um, so I'll let you introduce yourself and Hire for Hope a little bit. Yes, I would love to. So Ashley Ward, I'm born and raised in Grand Rapids, and I started a recruiting firm about six years ago, actually, called Hire for Hope. And so my background historically has been over a decade of recruiting experience, and I wanted to bundle up my love for my career with my passion for philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And so I created Hire for Hope in 2017, and now we have a team of 10 employees, wow. which is wild to think about. Mm -hmm. We actually doubled in size this year. Wow. Yeah, so it's been a good growth year for us. And we specialize in executive search, primarily for businesses in West Michigan. Okay. And then we also help them integrate assessment tools to really beef up their pre-hire process. Mm -hmm. So they make sure they get the right people in the right seats. Mm -hmm. And then the hope part of Hire for Hope is that we donate 10% of our profit back to specifically the YWCA okay. and their shelter here in Grand Rapids. Um, where I actually was a resident of back in the day over okay. a decade ago when I mm -hmm. went through a bad relationship. And they paid for my daughter and I to get an apartment for six months to get me back on my feet. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a job at the time. Mm -hmm. And so throughout that process, I fell into recruiting and just loved it. So mm -hmm. um, now Hire for Hope donates financially, but then we also as a team volunteer our time once a month to go to the shelter and help organize or uh, babysit the children or whatever they really mm -hmm. need during that time. That's great. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned you grew quite a bit your team this year. Hiring is a big topic right now. Uh -huh. um, are, what are some of the common challenges that you're seeing organizations having in recruiting and retaining talent? Yes, great question. Well, in 2021, we saw the great resignation, mm -hmm. quote unquote, where it seemed that everyone was open to work. I mm -hmm. think a lot of people felt like the grass might be greener on mm -hmm. the other side somewhere else. And just past the pandemic, there was a lot of shifting and movements around that time. Mm -hmm. And so now, um, this year in 2022, we're seeing a lot of people hunker down, so to speak. Um, everyone seemed to have made a shift last year. So mm -hmm. if you think about it, they're just entering their one year mark, so to speak, in their new mm -hmm. roles and with their new companies. And so we're seeing a lot of individuals that are hunkering down and not really open to making a career shift, mm -hmm. which is interesting from a recruiting perspective. Yeah. Um, so companies are having to get a lot more creative on how they're enticing talent mm -hmm. to come on board. What's interesting and also um, throws in a unique dynamic is that a lot of positions in, uh, that organizations are creating are getting more and more complex mm -hmm. because the needs of the business are just evolving so rapidly. They're trying to be forward thinking and think mm -hmm. about what complexities are going to come down the road for those positions. So it's not only a limited talent pool, it's like needle in a haystack, finding the unicorn. And those two things combined have been super tricky mm -hmm. to navigate. And so it's been keeping us busy. Mm -hmm. I'll say that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, what do you think the bigger issue is in West Michigan right now, finding the employees or keeping them on their team? I would say recruiting. So finding mm -hmm. the employees uh, is what I'm seeing in the marketplace. And I think the reason why, from a retention perspective, like I mentioned, a lot of people just shifted roles last year mm -hmm. or within the past 18, 24 months. And so retention isn't quite as as big of a hurdle right now that recruiting is for those mm -hmm. unique positions. What's also interesting is I feel like a lot of people shifted positions in companies because they were asking for so much more and unique benefits and perks. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're looking for that, you know, mm -hmm. greener pasture, so yeah. to speak. Mm -hmm. And so they're being extremely clear about exactly what they want from a re from a benefits perspective, which helps HR teams learn, okay, from a retention perspective, here's what we need to have in place in order to keep top talent. So mm -hmm. they're doing a good job, I think, trying to navigate that and put those things in place, trying to get extremely creative. I have a client that's looking at even um, creating a daycare for their employees and then also affordable housing. They mm -hmm. want to develop an affordable housing area right by their plant, mm -hmm. essentially to retain talent. Mm -hmm. So employers are getting very creative. Yeah. So I think that that is, you know, it's a work in, in process for sure. But I think the recruiting piece is super critical right now. It's it's where do you find people, especially mm -hmm. to meet all of the boxes and the criteria that they're looking for for those unique roles mm -hmm. has been challenging. And the right people too, not just any old person. It needs exactly. to be someone perfect for the role. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we help our clients navigate. Nice. Um, 
What advice do you have for organizations that are trying to overcome some of these staffing challenges? I think from an advice perspective, it's really getting creative with mm-hmm. how they're recruiting. And so um, it's just really looking at recruiting and talent acquisition as more of a strategic initiative. Mm-hmm. Historically, it's been viewed as more of a tactical initiative that just needs to be done to get people, essentially. Mm-hmm. And now it's you need to be strategic. You need to get creative in order to beat your competition to the top talent. Mm-hmm. And so I see very unique things that employers are doing to try to attack, uh, attract talent in different ways. And so I think that that's going to be at the forte of what businesses are doing for the next near future, at least mm-hmm. from a recruiting standpoint. Because mm-hmm. people's priorities have shifted over the last few years, too. Mm-hmm. So what they were looking for before might not necessarily be the same thing as what employees are looking for now. Exactly. Yeah. And so I think it's just critical right now to view recruiting as more of a strategic function and even hire internal recruiters, beef up their talent teams, or look at third-party recruiting firms as a partner. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So shifting gears a little bit, uh, mm-hmm. you recently met Wedgwood CEO and told him that you had a connection to Wedgwood. How would you describe your connection to Wedgwood Christian Services? Well, I've always been fond of Wedgwood Christian Services, and primarily because Wedgwood played a big role and had a large impact on me personally when I was an adolescent mm-hmm. in my teenage years. And so as a teenager, I would consider myself high risk, and um, at the time I, I was going through depression, um, had suicidal tendencies, and I was on a variety of prescription drugs. Uh, And so it's just interesting to look back at who I was then. To my core, I'm the same person, Mm -hmm. but just your environment and the chaos around you plays a huge role in your day-to-day life and Mm -hmm. how you react with others and how you feel about yourself, Mm -hmm. especially when you feel like you're not in control of your environment or your Mm -hmm. surroundings. And so during that time, I was a runaway youth, quote unquote, and my mom and I agreed that I should stay at Wedgwood. Hmm. And so I found myself inside Wedgwood and I had no idea what to expect really, but Mm -hmm. it was a great experience. And I think it taught me a lot about routine, about taking control of responsibilities in my life and things like that, that really helped me get out of depression mm-hmm. and um, become the adult I am today. So That's I'm thankful for Wedgwood. Wonderful. How how long were you in Wedgwood's care? Not long. I would say just a couple of weeks. Okay. So like a uh, respite type situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there anything from your time at Wedgwood that's really stuck with you throughout your life? Definitely. Uh, I think it goes back to that, the environment playing a role and in how I felt about myself and externally. And I think that for the first time when I was at Wedgwood, I felt like I was finally in control of my environment because Mm -hmm. they gave us certain responsibilities. Mm -hmm. We were responsible for maintaining the facility. And I'll never forget, there was an advocate that handed me a mop Mm -hmm. and said, you're going to mop the floor right now. I was like, what? I've never mopped a floor in my Uh life. Like, how do you even do it? Yeah. And so he took the time. He was patient and caring and he showed me how to mop a floor. And that's something that... I carried on into the workplace, you know, Mm -hmm. when I finally had gotten jobs later on in my teenage years and into my adulthood. It's just important that I think we recognize those things early on. And sometimes you're in environments or families that they just don't have the skills or the bandwidth to be able to teach youth those Mm -hmm. things, Mm -hmm. which is unfortunate. But luckily, Wedgwood stepped in and Mm -hmm. taught me how to mop floors. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's more than just mopping the floor, too. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's... Someone you knew how to ask questions, someone took the time to answer you, and yes. all of the things you can learn and apply later on after that. Definitely. And getting that respect, too, having that relationship with an adult, mm-hmm. you know, that's something that was new for me, mm-hmm. and I think that was really critical, too. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you want people to know about kids who need out-of-home placement or support like residential care here at Wedgwood? Yeah, I think it's just important for people to know that these children or these youth are going through experiences and a lot of times they feel like they're living in chaos or you know unsettled environments that they don't have any control over mm-hmm. and that's really how I felt at that time in my life it seemed like at any moment anything could be taken away from me and that's a really scary unsettling place to be mm-hmm. and so it was really empowering being at Wedgwood and having an adult say to me you are in control of this activity you are in control of what you're going to say 
hear. You don't have to share what you don't want to share. You're in control of this responsibility. We're counting on you. And all of those aspects all culminated into giving me confidence, I think. Mm -hmm. And so um, my takeaway is just that I hope other people can see that the children hear you know, they're not just told what to do all day. They're mm -hmm. they're empowered to become yeah. who they're going to become, which I think is great. Mm -hmm. And I like that you mentioned, you know, chaos and then coming into something with more stability. Mm -hmm. And I feel like um, a lot of the kids at Wedgwood are coming from total chaos and then to have stability where they can kind of find out who they are yeah. and then figure out when and where to take control mm -hmm. is really important. Exactly. I agree with that. And that's something that Wedgwood definitely instills to mm -hmm. its core, mm -hmm. which is great. Mm -hmm. uh, what advice would you give to a kid coming into Wedgwood's care today? I would say, uh, I mean, I hope they would capitalize on the opportunities that they're getting to be in control of those things. And um, I think it's just important to realize that when you feel like you're actually empowered and in control of activities, even if it's something small, let's say you have nothing you're in control of that, that day, but your attitude, you're mm -hmm. always in control of your attitude. And I think just starting to put those things together, that's my advice is to really just stay in tune with that mm -hmm. and, um, and try to learn as much as possible in the experience, because I think that a lot of the adolescents, especially me at the time, even you're almost shut off and mm -hmm. you're lacking that trust from the adult world, quote mm -hmm. unquote. And, mm -hmm. and so it's interesting. I think it's a really good opportunity for them to start picking up those pieces and taking control of who they are, even if it's little tiny baby steps, mm -hmm. just doing one thing a day they can to really mm -hmm. focus on themselves. And yeah. Yeah. yeah it's great advice. I mean, good advice for anyone, really, to just right. focus on what you can control and making the most of every opportunity, mm -hmm. even if it doesn't feel ideal at the time. Exactly. Which is hard to do. Easier said than done. Yes. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's important. Mm -hmm. um, so I've talked with a few of the kids in Wedwood's Employment Training Program mm -hmm. who, with the skills and confidence that they've learned and built through the employment training program, want to start their own businesses someday. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any encouragement for young people looking to be entrepreneurs? Definitely. Yeah. And I would say, if I can do it, anyone can do it. Uh, and when I was younger, I really didn't value education very much, mm -hmm. honestly. And I actually dropped out of high school because I wanted to work. I wanted to go make money, I think. And, and I craved like uh, having that responsibility for myself and making something of myself, really. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting how I didn't value education in that process. But what I've learned throughout my journey is that knowledge really is power. Mm -hmm. And so I did get my GED. I went to get my undergrad in, uh, in counseling, actually, in mm -hmm. psychology counseling from Cornerstone University. And so I just started to value education because I connected these dots Growing up, I always felt like anything could be taken away from me at any moment, which is a scary feeling. Mm -hmm. And so I started to connect these dots that one of the only things I could think of that no one could take away from me ever was knowledge, mm -hmm. education. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I started to really appreciate it and think, wow, whether it's a formal education or I have a mentor or I'm just observing what other people do, mm -hmm. I've done all of those things that have helped me become who I am today to become an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. It's um, staying in touch with just how I view things, what I observe in people, those skills I pick up on, and that knowledge. That knowledge really is power. And so that's really my advice mm -hmm. to those individuals who want to become entrepreneurs. Yeah. Super exciting. Yeah. Well, and, you know, teenagers always are a little like, oh, I know best. But <laughs> yeah, that's you the don't challenge. You, yes. And the more you know, the more, the better you can be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So I hope they stay in touch with that mm -hmm. piece. Um, so like you mentioned, a big part of your business philosophy and company mission is to give back to impactful organizations in our community. Why is that important for you to incorporate into your business model and not just like into your own personal giving? Yeah, good question. Um, for me, and what I'm seeing too, just generationally, is that younger generations, they want to have an impact. Mm -hmm. They really want to have a voice, an impact. Philanthropy is super critical and important to them. And I was one of those people. Mm -hmm. So through my career, I started to realize that there was just such a disconnect between coming to work every day, clocking in, clocking out, so to speak, even though I was in my career, 
I wasn't seeing how it impacted the community. Mm -hmm. And it really wasn't, honestly. It was more for the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And so I think I'm not the only one. I think there's all these generations coming up. They really want to see their impact aside from the bottom line. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was important in my career to have that impact uh, from a philanthropic perspective. And so I created the company the way I did so that it, it was really intentional. I think the other interesting thing about it is that I wanted a laser focus mm -hmm. just to serve one or two nonprofits that had supported me in my life. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone can find their calling when it comes to philanthropy of what mm -hmm. they're passionate about, maybe different nonprofits that have impacted them in their lives. And that's exactly what I did. And mm -hmm. it's it's so great now to see my team get engaged mm -hmm. and involved with what I do and to see them go in and volunteer once a month at the YWCA in particular. And we do some work too with Wedgwood, which has been awesome. And it's um, been really re rewarding mm -hmm. to that degree. It's great. Mm -hmm. Do you see a value in terms of retaining and engaging staff through in partnerships with nonprofits? Like, is that a, a big benefit for your staff? Definitely. And that's part of the mission. When we interview for internal positions on our team, we want to make sure that that's a priority to them because mm -hmm. it is, you know, living and breathing every day. It's who we are mm -hmm. is that philanthropic piece to what we're doing. And I think it's especially critical because it's directly impacting the community. Mm -hmm. And so making sure we find those like minded individuals that want to help us give back to the community. Uh, and so it's great when I see it play out in real life and my mm -hmm. team is in there, you know, in the field. Um, and then we give back financially as well. But I think it's not only a theme for my company. I see a lot of companies, like I mentioned earlier, is getting creative with their benefits. Mm -hmm. And so companies that have a dedicated volunteer amount of hours that their employees are able to do per year, per mm -hmm. month, has been really impactful. And I think that it's helping the next generations be able to come to work every day, but know that they're giving back in some way that's not just connected to the bottom line. Mm -hmm. They're more than just a cog in the machine. They are actually making a difference in their neighborhoods and communities. Exactly. Yeah. Um, if people want to learn more about how Hire for Hope can help them identify and develop their teams, how they how can they connect with you? Great question. Well, visit our website, hireforhope.com. We do have contact forms on there too. And I would love to hear from anyone, any company that's looking to hire or develop their talent, as well as anyone looking for a job. We do help those individuals as well. Mm -hmm. And then third is anyone who wants to connect with my story is always super impactful for me. I love to hear other people's stories and how we might connect and have synergies. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, following us on LinkedIn and Facebook. We're very active there too. That's great. I took a peek at your website and you've got some really helpful helpful blogs there too. People are yes. looking just for some ideas on how they can beef up their HR teams. You've got mm -hmm. a great resource on your website as well. Thank you. Yep. I put all of my employees to work <laughs> to write those and they turn out great. Yeah. So. And I'll make sure to link all of that in the episode description too so people can find them. Thank you. Well, Ashley, thank you so much for being here and sharing your story with us today. Wedgwood is honored to have played a small part in your life and we are thrilled to celebrate this, your success in, this, in your business and in our as a community leader. Uh, it's been such a joy to have this coffee break conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.